and welcome back to Anton Math. Now in the last video we looked at some of our fundamental trig identities and we looked at simplifying trigonometric expressions by using these identities. And in this video we're going to be looking at verifying or proving new identities based on the identities that we already have. So first I want to talk about proving an identity and, and some helpful things to keep in mind when we're doing this process. Um, the first helpful hint that I can give is be very familiar and comfortable with all of the tools at your disposal. Now in our case, our trigonometric identities are invaluable here. Really to succeed in a, in a pre-calculus 2 course when you're dealing with proving trigonometric identities, you really need to know all of the identities that you have. Um, there's really no way around it. If you don't know the identities, you're going to come across some problems that you're not going to be able to solve just by looking at them. You, you have to have these identities as tools in your Batman math belt that you can just pull out and use when the situation arises. Now the second uh, thing that we want to keep in mind is that we always start with one side of the identity and manipulate that side to get to the other side. In other words, we're going to start with the left hand side of the identity to get to the right hand side or start with the right hand side to get to the left hand side. And let me embellish on this a little bit just so we can see what I mean. Let's say we want to verify the identity um, x plus 1 squared minus 1 oops, is equal to x squared plus 2x. Okay, now let's just say we want to prove this identity and instead of following my advice up here, I just say, well, let's just start here. Let's start with x plus 1 squared minus 1 equals x squared plus 2x. Okay, I have this equality. Well, I can add 1 to both sides. I get x plus 1 squared is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1. Oh, I can factor this right-hand side, so I'm going to get x plus 1 squared is equal to x plus 1 squared. So now I have, now I'm absolutely sure these sides are equal. So you might think to yourself, okay, cool. So we've shown that our original statement, x plus 1 squared minus 1, is equal to x squared plus 2x. But in reality, we haven't. There's a couple of problems with this. The real problem at the root of why this method doesn't work is that if we start from here, if we start from this step, if you're asked to show that these are true, and you start by setting one side equal to the other side, you've already made an assertion that they are true. Okay, when, as soon as you write this down, you said these are equal to each other. Okay, now if you're trying to prove that they're equal to each other, but you start with the statement they are equal to each other, well really, we finished the problem with this first step, didn't we? We said, well, this left side's equal to this right side, so I'm done. They're equal. There's nothing else to do. These other steps were just unnecessary because we finished the problem before we even started the problem. Okay, there's a, there's, uh, this is the most common mistake when trying to prove these identities. If you just start with it at the beginning, really anything else you do after that is just extra work. But you haven't shown anything. What you've shown is that x plus 1 squared equals x plus 1 squared with the assumption that x plus 1 squared minus 1 was already equal to x squared plus 2x. Now doing something like this can provide you with some help. Um, you can kind of see some of the steps that you would want to take, but really if we want to do this problem what we would need to do is start with x plus 1 squared minus 1 as an expression, just all by itself. Now I'm going to say equals to, I'm not going to put x squared plus 2x, I'm going to manipulate this expression to get it to the point where it equals that right hand side. So I know I can expand this x plus 1 squared, x plus 1 squared is x squared plus 2x plus 1, and I still have this minus 1 here, so the 1 and minus 1 cancel, and I get this is equal to x squared plus 2x. See, now I've shown that x plus 1 squared minus 1 is equal to x squared plus 2x, but I never had to assume that statement to begin with. Okay, this is a very important thing. And let me show you another example just to show you why this doesn't work. And really, whenever we're proving an identity or proving anything in mathematics or science, 
we need to always make sure we're using a method that works 100% of the time. And while it's true that if I start with these equal, I get to these equal, and it turns out that these are indeed equal, let's just say I start with something like sine x equals negative sine x. See now if I start here and I square both sides, I'm going to get sine squared x is equal to, I'm squaring the right hand side so the negative goes away, this is sine squared x. So exactly like in the last one, I got to a point where they're both equal. The problem here is, is that my original statement that I started with is not true. We never have a situation where sine of x is equal to negative sine of that same value x. Okay, so if this method over here does work, then that means that I've just proven that sine of x equals negative sine of x. And actually we can prove a lot of pretty ridiculous things by starting with them equal to each other at the beginning. We can show that 0 is equal to 1, for example. Okay, so it's very important. We always want to start with one side, manipulate that side alone as an expression to try to get it to the form of the right-hand side. And we can even start with the right-hand side and get to the left-hand side too. There's no problem with that at all. Now, my last tip here for proving these identities is keep in mind that we always have at our disposal creative multiplication by 1. And one of the more helpful instances is, of this comes from one of those expansion or factoring formulas that we learned in a pre-calculus 1 class. Remember that a plus b times a minus b is equal to a squared minus b squared. And this goes in both directions. If we have a squared minus b squared, we could also write that as a plus b times a minus b. Now this comes in particularly handy uh, when we have some of these mixed trig equations. For example, let's just say I have 1 over 1 plus cosine x, and I want to change my denominator. I, I'm trying to get this to look like something else. I can creatively multiply by 1, keeping this um, kind of formula or identity up here in mind. If I multiply this bottom by 1 minus cosine x, and the top by 1 minus cosine x, now look, on the top I still have 1 minus cosine x, and, and in a given problem, you know, there will be something else that maybe will help us out here. But on the bottom, using this identity, I now have 1 minus cosine squared x. Now this is the most common way we're going to use this. We're going to have 1 plus or 1 minus some trig function. We multiply it by, this is called the reciprocal expression, 1 plus cosine x and 1 minus cosine x, or sorry, not, not reciprocal, uh, conjugate, conjugate expressions. And 1 minus cosine x, we know from our Pythagorean identity, this is 1 minus cosine x over sine squared x. And let's just say maybe the problem's asking us to get to something. Um, we know one, uh, 1 over sine squared x is cosecant squared x. We have minus cosine over sine is cotangent. So this is cosecant x cotangent x. OK, so I didn't really have a problem in mind here, but just to show you how we can use this multiplication by 1 creatively to kind of get to a situation where we can apply our identities. We'll see a lot of 1 plus trig functions and 1 minus trig functions, and sometimes we need to get something squared on the bottom or we need to turn it into something else, and the Pythagorean identities are a very great way to do that, but in order to use them in the first place, we need to get some squares in there. So This is a good way to do that. Okay, so these are some of our tips. Now let's look at a couple of examples, and then we'll do some more examples in the next video. Let's do two examples here. Let's verify that sine theta over tangent theta is equal to cosine theta. So we need to be familiar with our identities and also we want to start with one side and get to the other side. Now it's not always the case, but usually it's easier to start with the more complicated side. Right, if we start with something more complicated, we can kind of proceed in a simplification manner like we did in the last video to try to get to this simple answer. And we'll have some examples later that the simpler side is easier to work with when we're you know, going to expand with our addition formulas or something like that. Uh, but let's take a look here and let's go ahead and start with our left hand side. So I have sine theta. And by my reciprocal identity, tangent theta is equal to sine theta 
over cosine theta. Now I'm dividing by a fraction, so this is the same as taking my numerator, sine theta over 1, and multiplying it by the reciprocal of my denominator, which is cosine theta over sine theta. And we see now we get a cancellation in the signs, and we're done. All we have left is cosine theta. This is our right-hand side. So we're doing left-hand side equals this. We got over here. This is our right-hand side. We've proven our identity. Okay, so this is a simple example. Let's take a look at a little bit more complicated one. Prove that 1 over secant x plus tangent x plus 1 over secant x minus tangent x is equal to 2 secant x. Okay, so I'm adding fractions. Whenever we add fractions, and we can kind of take some context from the problem, I know here my right-hand side just has one single term, so on my left-hand side my goal should be to combine these together into a single term and then try to simplify down to 2 secant x. So when you combine these to a single term we need to get a common denominator. So I have 1 over secant x tangent x, sorry secant x plus tangent x, so you get a common denominator, I need to multiply top and the bottom by secant x minus tangent x over secant x minus tangent x. Plus, now over here I have 1 over secant x minus tangent x. And to get that common denominator, I need to multiply the top and the bottom by secant x plus tangent x. Okay, so let's go ahead and simplify this out a bit. On the top here, from this first term, I have secant x minus tangent x plus, from my second term here, I have secant x plus tangent x all over. My common denominator now is this product, secant x plus tangent x times secant x minus tangent x. we can do some simplification. On the top we see I have a plus tangent and a minus tangent, so these cancel. And I'm left with just 2 secant x on the top. On the bottom I can use that multiplication property we have. We see these are conjugate expressions. I have a plus b times a minus b, where a is secant and b is tangent. So this becomes a squared, or secant squared, minus b squared, or tangent squared. So now again, with my context clues, my final answer should be 2 secant x. So really now we want to find a way that we can manipulate this denominator to get it to equal 1. Right? That should be, as long as our problem that we're given is actually true, that should be possible here. So I can use my Pythagorean identity. I know, well let's just go ahead and write this 2 secant x on top. I know that secant squared x by Pythagorean identity is tangent squared x plus 1. And I still have this minus tangent squared x. This is exactly what we need because now I have plus tangent squared x minus tangent squared x. And I'm left with 2 secant x over 1 or just 2 secant x. And we're done. All right, now in the next video, I'm just going to do some more examples of these uh, proving trig identities to get some more practice, and we'll see you there.